Happy New Year, everyone. Ooh, 2023. That is <laughs> weird to say. I don't, I'm not quite, it's, it is 2023 officially, but I don't feel like I'm not there yet. Well, we haven't written it yet, so it can't be. <laughs> It's true, yeah, right? It's like until you have to start writing or typing it's 2023, it doesn't exist. But well, anyway. We're not really into New Year's resolutions, but we are into setting intentions for a year. Yes. And one of the things that we love most about the cruising lifestyle is the community. And there have been so many times where we have been sitting down having an in incredible conversation and then thought, wow, I wish we would have had a camera rolling for that. And that's kind of what we want to do in 2023 is share more stories like that. Just conversations like the first one here with Frank and Mary Grace on Ticket to Ride. Yep, because we spent weeks living with them in the two Omotus and we were drawn to them because nice. they've had a similar journey, which is where they started off in a really great production boat and then decided to go into performance sailing. And we wanted to know a lot more about what that journey has been like, what that evolution has been like. And because there are different boats yeah. for different types of cruisers, for different types of cruisings, and for different seasons of life. That was a mouthful. It was. <laughs> so please keep in mind, this is just an honest conversation based on our experiences and their experiences, and it's just our opinions. Yes. So. Let's just dive right in at the beginning, which is how did they end up with their first cruising boat? First boat, tell us okay, that. Okay, looking at Frank. Well, our first <laughs> boat is a Fountain Bejo, and we spent four days at the Annapolis Boat Show in 2012. We looked at a lot of boats, we really did. But I will tell you, the size fit, the cabins fit, but what really sold us on the Fountain Bejo was our home station. It really okay. Oh, yeah. It we went through perfect. boats and we sat at the helm station and we went to the galley and where could we communicate between the galley and the helm station and we knew we were going to buy a production boat because we kind of figured we were going to put it in charter for a year, 18 months, which we ended up doing and the Fountain Peugeot just seemed like it was a really good solid choice for that. Solid choice mm -hmm. for what we wanted. We liked the general layout. We even like the little sunning area up mm -hmm. at the top. Lounge deck. Yeah. It was the same for us on Curiosity. Like we looked at the lagoon and it was so separate. Yes, exactly. And the Leopard 43 was an older one, so they were right there. We could mm -hmm. talk, communicate, exactly. and that was important. Yeah, it right. felt connected. And I think that's the difference too of how many people you have on board. With just two of us, we wanted we want to know that person still yeah. at the helm seat. Right, like, yeah, like, not completely out of sight, out yeah. of mind. But I think when you have a larger crew on board, then they like that separation. So I do think it has to do with the way you yeah. use your vessel. And you guys are so similar to us, which is why we are here and having this yeah. conversation. So, yeah. okay. But I think, too, it was really important that lack of separation allowed... I know you do a lot of food prep and stuff, so you're not isolated then. You can still participate. You don't feel like you're just the galley slave. So and we can still have a conversation with one of us, like if Jason's at the helm and I'm inside at the galley, that communication is still there. We're not yelling at each other. You're exactly. just having a conversation. That is, it, I think it is a big deal when you've only it got a few people on board. Yeah. But, you know, we definitely, there were some things that we had to check the boxes off. We had to have a forward-facing nav station. We had to have an outdoor dining table. We really wanted a door that opened more than just one little sliding door. We wanted a good walkway, easy walkway in between cockpit and salon. So there were a lot of things we had to check off. But if you asked us, okay, what was that final thing that made you the decision on one boat versus the other? It was the layout and our helm station. But we probably didn't know enough. I don't think there was enough difference in the performance between the boats we were looking at probably not. to really make a difference mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Yeah. I would agree with that because for us looking at, you know, we were looking at Fountain Peugeot, Leopard, Lagoon, I can't even... Some other random ones. Yeah, yeah some other, you know, smaller brands, this, that, and the other. But generally, yeah, they all were going to be so similar. It exactly. really came down to which boat do you like. I know. Yeah. It yeah. was kind of like, well, I like this kitchen, yeah. I like that bathroom. Yeah. Like, no, that's, but that's how a house or apartment is, right? Yeah. And, and people give, you know, kind of gave us a hard time because they're like, you're looking at the wrong things. But generally, <laughs> when you were looking at a production boat in that yeah. area, they, you know... Tomato, tomato. Yeah. You're making certain assumptions that the bulkhead's going to be glued to the hull, that the doors are going to, you know, stay attached to the door frame. You're making assumptions that they all have kind of equal storage. 
So, yeah. okay, what other features do you like or not like? How long did you have your FP before you decided to start looking for something else? So we kind of got to the point where we're like, okay, we really enjoyed this lifestyle. We, we were had been living aboard for a little over a year. And we said, but we really want something that's going to perform a little better. Right. So then we said, what can we do to make this boat perform a little better? What were our biggest complaints? Number one, we couldn't sail to win. And number two, we would like to go a little faster. So we replaced our sails with North 3DI sails. A square top main and a furling Genoa. It did make a difference. Yeah. But it didn't make enough of a wow for us to say, no, no. Uh, Maybe five degrees true we could sail more upwind. Yes, probably That's, five degrees I mean, true, maybe is, four or five degrees it's not apparent. Nothing. No, it's yeah. not nothing, and, and it's not bashing either fountain phaser no. or 3DI sails. It made a difference, but it didn't make enough for yeah, what we wanted. But our true wind angle sailing upwind we probably went from 72 <laughs> to maybe 66, true 67. Yeah. He's talking true, true wind, but give, yeah. us true your, wind. give us apparent. Apparent probably went from 47 or 48 okay. to 42. Okay. okay. Maybe 41. Yeah. Maybe 43. That's, something like that. That's pretty good for a production. Yeah, yeah mid production. Right. Yeah. So we did like what that. we could, mm -hmm. but even so, it wasn't enough wow to land our feet in our Fountain Peugeot and say, okay, this is it forever. Yeah. There were so many things that we started thinking about. We were thinking about, uh, we're going to go to the Pacific. And we knew our sales in the Pacific were going to be longer than our sails in the Atlantic, so we wanted more speed. We weren't at all opposed to more space. You know, it'd be nice to have a little bit more space. That was everything we had, just about. We didn't well, own a house, we, we didn't yeah. own cars. <laughs> yeah. That was everything. So and we well, also had a four cabin that was worked well for the charter business. We kind of really wanted the owner's suite to add a little more storage and a little more comfort for our side. What did you look at when you decided to go searching for a performance boat? Well, at the time, there weren't really as many choices even as there are now, yeah. but we really had three main boats we were looking at. The Ultramar 5X, okay. we were looking at the Balance 526, and we were looking at the H855, even though the H855 there was not even one in the water yet. Wow. <laughs> there were quite a few Ultramares, and I think Balance had had one or two on the water. Yeah, it um, really, again, with like it's amazing what just a short time period has done oh, yes. for the for the whole world of catamarans because there are a lot more options. So many more. What were your big ticket items? Like, what were the things that you were like, this is what we want in our next boat? We wanted better performance. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be able to sail more places, not motor sail. We wanted to be able to get places faster because the shorter the time you're out on passages, the safer it is. The more weather you can afford. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We wanted space. We wanted just a better fit and finish too. We wanted, um, I mean our boat was a production boat and it had been in charter and it had been heavily chartered because it was a brand new Helia in the Caribbean. So it had been heavily chartered. And I think that there was a point where when we started looking at the higher performance boats, we had to make a decision. Are we going to stretch a little bit and learn more about sailing, become better sailors, challenge ourselves? with you know a higher performing boat or are we going to go production and just be happy with more along the condo morans and kind of stay at the same level and i think that this boat has upped our skill set yeah oh it's you? definitely upped our skill set because i think when we moved onto this boat we knew we knew a lot about systems and batteries and uh, marine toilets and <laughs> water, makers. <laughs> water makers and through holes and hose clamps and all the things that you really need to kind of like get familiar with mm -hmm. and it's really good to get familiar with those maybe on a boat that's an entry-level boat mm -hmm. but what we where we, we really I don't think either of us really knew how to sail this boat when we took over um, we were still always sailing on apparent wind angles we were always sailing um, on roller reefing, you know, Genoa. We only, really only had a mainsail. We had a Genoa and we had an asymmetric spinnaker. That's so exactly what we had. Yeah. Our asymmetric spinnaker, when we took over this boat, that was kind of like something we did not want to do because of its size and its manageability. And so we kind of had to create a whole different sail plan. And mm -hmm. learn how to handle that and sail plan. And learn how to handle that sail plan and what works and what doesn't work. And how fast do we want to sail it and so many different things. You were looking at that, the Utramir, the Balance, the HH. What was that kind of, that thing that cinched that one for you? For me, one of the really huge things about this boat, we, we were able to go out on a test sail on the very first 55. Um, so thanks, Doug and Deb. 
and um, it was so quiet. I mean, it was amazing to me. There was no rigging noise. There were no squeaks and creaks, and that to me just lowered my whole blood pressure because on on the other boat, they just had, there were a lot of squeaks and creaks and. Sounds. Slams. And, yeah. yeah, it just sounds a lot more intense even when you're not necessarily going exactly. all that fast. Right. It can just, it yes. can still sound like you're going really fast and sometimes like the boat's going to break, but it's right. really not. No, it's, it's not, just but it noises. just sounds, yeah. yes. So that was big for me. I'm sure you had much more serious quantifiable stuff. Well, I think did. there were two really big things for me is when I was going to be looking at a bigger performance boat that was going to be going faster and we we're going to cover a lot of ocean miles. Carbon fiber really sold it for me. Um, carbon fiber is just, to me, when we sold Let It Be, we had spider cracks in the gel coat all along all of our capture routes around so many different places. Um, but carbon fiber is the way to go. And then walking into this salon, the difference in space, I almost couldn't figure it out. How does HH and Morelli and Melvin design this boat in a 55 foot boat? with the size salon that we have and a comfortable cockpit that we have versus when I walked into the Ultramare or I walked into the Balance, it was just a totally different size feel. Um, mm -hmm. And there really wasn't that much difference in overall in the length, length of, our, well, of the boat. And actually the Ultramare was 60 feet. You know, we were dealing with a fiberglass boat, a fiberglass boat, and a carbon fiber boat. Between carbon fiber and walking in here into the salon on Minnehaha, which is HH55, a one? I was sold. I mean, I would have had to have an incredible experience on the other two boats to make that purchase. Right. And part of that is the fit and finish, the quality of the finishes, the, it just the whole package was yeah. very, I mean, it, uh, for us, it just felt different. It, mm -hmm. it just felt better. Yeah. So. Okay, so now here we are. Fast forward four yeah. years. Can you believe it? I know, right? Because you went from an FP44. Yeah to this it was a big jump in size but also i mean how many sales you have the lines the dagger boards there was a lot more to deal with so how long did it take you from delivery to feeling comfortable with operating everything it didn't take that long were we really good at it at first no were we quick 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 at it no but it was it's not such a complicated boat that it's hard to learn I think. What do you think? We still knew the difference between a halyard and a main sheet. We still knew how to control a main. We still yeah. knew how to control a Genoa. So many of those things are kind of basic. But to get what we wanted out of the boat took a little while. But to feel comfortable with it, like, oh yeah, we can do this. Because right. that was the most common question we would get when we would have demo guests come on the boat when we were in Long Beach, California. Is can the two of you guys sail this right. boat by Is yourself? Is this too much boat for you? Is yeah. this too much boat for you? Do you need crew? Yeah. And we really, we pretty confidently, almost always said, yes, uh, I would no. love to have somebody else clean the extra 50 yeah. for me. <laughs> but but um, you don't need somebody else to no, sail this. No, the handling, the, yeah. the electric winches are so helpful. The rigging is so well done. We just, I felt pretty comfortable with it. Pretty Did quickly. I know it all? Yeah. Did I know how to do it all? Did I know how to really tweak every little bit and what sail to use in what situation? No. But you could be working on that the rest of your life. You could exactly. be. Yeah. yeah. But as far as like feeling confident to take off and go for a passage. Mm -hmm. like, no, that didn't take very long. Yeah. So give me a time frame. A week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. We did the Cabo Regatta, which is a fine night overnight, okay. two months after we took possession. Oh my gosh. And we had two or three weekends going to Catalina and back. Uh, in between yeah, right in that two month period of time so quick really it wasn't quick. it was not a big learning curve no yeah so I will I would I would sort of echo that and I don't know about you Jason how you feel but I if, when you first walk on it's I was intimidating. it's a little intimidating because I'm like oh are we gonna have this many bits and bobs <laughs> everywhere and there's there's how just many lines the sale have? choices which you have a very large sale package so you've got a lot of different options depending on what's happening with the weather watching and participating and seeing I already feel which is all feel more confident already. yes I feel so much more confident with all of it That's and good. just going oh, okay this is far less complicated than it initially looks it's just another Genoa and another main like if you just every sale is just a sale it just which one are you choosing to put up you know I would think that the bigger I'm not gonna say conflict but the bigger adjustment is the fact that Frank is more confident in his sailing. He wants to go faster than I do sometimes. And I'm I always... a little bit more of a risk taker. <laughs> 
And I'm like, this is my home. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to fly my washing machine out of water. <laughs> yeah, right? That's my yeah. KitchenAid. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly right. Don't throw the KitchenAid off the counter. So that took us longer than anything for me to become more comfortable because I liken this boat to a horse that wants to grab the bit and go. It, mm -hmm. You have seen this. This boat is so completely comfortable at 10 knots no matter what. I mean, it just likes to go 10 knots. It doesn't want to go slower than 10 knots. No. It and, struggles. Right. But that's fine, and that's really comfortable. It's when we start getting to the 16, 17, 18 that I get a little, like, you know, <laughs> a little nervous. Um, so yeah. that took us longer, definitely, for me to become more comfortable and confident that I knew how to properly depower. And I did know how to depower it because they went in commissioning. We went through all that. Yeah. It's more a matter of getting Frank to agree to depower it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's also good to have somebody on the reins that's probably not... Yes. As much of a risk taker. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> one plus things. We Otherwise, really nobody will ever yet. say, slow down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Are you right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have this young friend named Tommy who he and Frank love to sail together in Hawaii, and you've got all those wind effects between the island. And Mary Grace was always the one yanking the reins on those two guys. It's like, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. Not comfortable. Fair away. Fair away. Yeah. Fair yeah. Away. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Come down, come, come down, down come down, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> He's so, probably watching. Oh, yeah. Man. yeah. So um, that was probably our biggest adjustment, I think. Yeah, to summarize kind of what we were talking about, what were we looking for? Mm -hmm. When we transitioned into a new boat, I thought we would either have to choose space or choose speed. But when we, just the first time we got on Minnehaha in Fort Lauderdale, we we're like, whoa, this could be space and speed, mm -hmm. an upgrade on both. It was just really really eye-opening we were really surprised yeah, yeah. and but, delighted well and everything that we've looked at that's older performance boats because that's kind of what we were originally looking at is we thought oh well we weren't going to buy anything new we were just going to buy an older performance catamaran and maybe just kind of outfit it right. the way that we wanted to and everything it felt like was absolutely we were going to have a lot more length but a lot less space. I know, it's amazing. So it really was that sacrifice of, we're gonna have a larger boat yet, we're gonna have less space, but we'll have speed. Mm -hmm. And it did feel like a huge compromise, but I don't feel like we're making that compromise anymore. Yeah. We're actually gaining a lot of space mm -hmm. in the same footprint, essentially, that we had with our, yeah. with our first boat, with our Leopard, and yet we're gaining a lot of performance. Significantly so if it's anything like this boat, you know, shockingly. If I'm struggling to get her to go slower than 10 knots, it's going to be, it's going to be good. <laughs> when I think of a performance boat, I think of lightweight. I think, you know, not loads of insulation. They're just, they're trying to keep the boat light so that it will perform well, which a lot of people associate with only being a good boat for one type of environment. You know, you're not going to get air conditioners. You don't have a lot of insulation. Definitely not a cold weather boat. But clearly you've proved that this is a true kind of expedition vessel by taking it to Alaska. Because you're now in the tropics. You've been in Alaska. I don't I can't think of many other environments, you know, but I'm like, you've you've done a, a, a broad range. So what was that like? How did the boat perform when you were in Alaska? First of all, yes, we did go to Alaska, but we're not doing like the Northwest Passage. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You know, we're doing southeast Alaska, which yes, it is still Alaska, and yes, it is cold. We water. never traveled at nighttime, and we were motoring most of the time. Right, so performance um, from the standpoint of sailing was non-existent. Yeah. Because you just don't have the right winds. You don't, you don't have the right wind, you were inside all the time. But I would say this, our passage from Hawaii to Alaska was not only one of the best, but it was also one of the most interesting because we had five people on board, and we had thick fog on the ocean for five days. Ooh. And we that was our that was our only passage where we did two hundred miles every day, every day. And wow. in those 12, conditions, in twelve days, yeah, we went from Hawaii to Alaska. We were running radar. We had great crew, but barreling along in the ocean at ten or twelve knots when you can't see more than a hundred or two hundred yards. But what are you going to do? You're going to creep? I mean, you know, well, you we just can't it wasn't do it. like we were right on the on the shoreline. We were no, oh, yeah, we out were out to sea, but still, that's we were still out to sea. nerve. Yeah, it was yeah. nerve wracking. You, you're what, you're sitting up at the helm and you're on your watch, but I don't know what you're watching for. We're watching than, the radar. Yeah, screen. that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just, hoping you see nothing. But we did great in Alaska, I think, because we do have reverse cycle air conditioners, you know, all through the boat. But we really didn't even run them that much because 
just didn't feel like we really needed them. Mm -hmm. Could have used a dehumidifier, but that's definitely not the, that's not the book's problem. If you go to Alaska, get dehumidifiers. dehumidifiers. Uh, or, New or New Zealand. Or, yeah. <laughs> or New Zealand, yeah. yes. Or New Zealand, we'll probably get one before we go to New Zealand, for sure. Or, or pretty three. much anywhere in the tropics during the rainy season. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just get basically get a dehumidifier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. the answer. If you live on a boat, get a dehumidifier. Yeah. At any point, did you feel like it, that was a bad choice or that your vessel couldn't handle it or no, that she, you shouldn't be in cold weather or anything like that? I can't remember any place that we decided we did not want to go because of the nature of our vessel. No, not at all. Um, we kind of jokingly said, well, maybe we should put some reinforcements on the bow or something. <laughs> yeah. But we, d I mean, it really wasn't necessary. It was just vigilance that was necessary. But your, your vessel is totally capable. Yeah, if absolutely. I, if I would say there was anything about a, quote, lightweight vessel, it's the fact that we don't want to carry more than 200 feet of anchor chain. And we were anchoring in 100 feet of every water. other night. So we were on 200 feet of chain plus 75 feet of line quite often. But fortunately we had, I mean the anchorages are so beautiful, it's just amazing. And so we had very protected places. Super protected. They're was, calm, they're glassy, smooth. You've yeah. got 1,500 foot walls all around you in a lot of the anchorages. Yeah, they're stunning. so beautiful. It's probably like being, a, being on a dock yeah. almost yeah. just because it was so calm yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. Not yeah. prettier, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't usually have bears. On docks. No. Mm -mm. Mm. no. So. <laughs> yeah. I will say though, we did when we p would pull our boat into a lot of the Alaska marinas, yeah. really docks. Yeah. We would get a lot of looks. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, I can it's imagine. mostly like salmon fishing boats that are aluminum <laughs> and steel. And yeah. It's like it's really interesting. Yeah. Where did this come did from? Did you guys make a wrong turn? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But the people were really nice people to us. People were super nice. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else that you can think of as far as like switching from kind of a cruising boat to a performance boat? Any advice that you would give somebody or if they were hesitant? We've kind of almost just talked about like data mm -hmm. as we've looked at boats. Or why did we switch boats? But I think Mike Grace and I also had this why not factor um, from a standpoint of we're not taking our money with us. And <laughs> We felt financially comfortable to do any of the boats that we mentioned. And so if we like the lifestyle and we want to move on in our skills, why not? Yeah. And a lot of people have asked us, you know, why did you sell your boat when you had a good boat and you could take it to the Caribbean, you yeah. take it to the Pacific and other Helios have circumnavigated? Because For we sure. could do it and it's fun. And yeah. it adds, I will say, sailing this boat is so fun. Yeah. Well, so fun. Sailing Let It Be was fun, but when we would hit seven or eight knots, we would start looking at each other saying, okay, what's going on? This is, we're either getting overpowered or we're going to break something or something like that. The sailing this boat, I, I can go 10, 12, 14, 15 knots, and I know it can handle everything that I'm, hand, can go I'm giving it. <laughs> so it's like, why not? It's fun. That's, I enjoy sailing. The getting there part is as much fun as the being there part. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that we haven't mentioned is we sail this boat probably 80% of the time. Uh, we don't motor very often. We'll go six months without refueling at least because we can sail. Yeah. And we went 90 miles or something in the day and it wasn't a particularly great point of sail, but the boat can handle it. And so that makes what used to be an overnight sail mm -hmm. or a, okay, we've got to start at two in the morning. Yeah. It makes it a day sale for us, which just makes so many more places accessible. Mm -hmm. And and it's actually fun, you know, it's quiet. It's that's why we have a sailboat. It's fun to be out there and not have the noise and know the wind is propelling us and mm -hmm. so yeah. it's been fun. Sailing this boat is just come to this. <laughs> I, I I would just wanted to say that <laughs> Frank, you, you just were wanted to pick up the cocoates and go through all that mess just to take us for a day sail. So I think that pretty much sums it up. Like, you love sailing this boat. Oh, I do. And you're willing to go through that mess and that hassle of anchoring and unanchoring and sailing and doing the, all these sail changes just to take us out on a day where we could get a 110 degree angle exactly. and, and fly these sails. And that was so much fun for us and to see yeah. you guys just... Mm -hmm. The way you move together and work together, it makes us It's really... exciting for us because, yeah, because yeah, you're going, man, I mean, if the two of you can handle this boat. And, and you guys are going to do great. Yeah, well, and the fact that you do it with ease. Like, it's not 
it's not a big thing. It's not a big deal. It's very, like, you're enjoying yourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I hope we've brought some things to the table for you guys as far as sale plan goes. You know, what sales do you need? How are they going to work into your sailing adventures? Mm -hmm. How are they going to get you from point A to point B? And have fun in the meantime. For sure. And yes, on the sale plan. Because we knew we wanted a good downwind sale, but we didn't know what. And having the option to be able to have it on furler makes a big difference. So yes, we want a good downwind sail, whether that's some sort of a spinnaker or a reacher. Yeah, that Drifter or yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, sales exactly. that I didn't even know exist. I was online well, the other day yeah. looking them all up and I'm like, okay, this is that it okay, okay, that's what that thing is. Yep. Yeah. Some exactly. of the names we've kind of yeah, made up made ourselves, up. you know. Well, because I was okay, I just have to tell you, get tired of that. That's a spinnaker asymmetry, yeah. code Z, code twelve, code whatever. I'm like Code blue, that's an emergency. <laughs> so they do just need yeah. the name. Can we just use one word yeah. and not have all of them start with a G? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Jennifer, oh. Genoa, yes. yeah. Oh. Jibs. Jibs, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We're very big proponents in it doesn't matter, and I wrote this in that blog post I told you about that it doesn't matter if your boat is big or small or old or new or pink or gray or yellow. Mm -hmm. You just have to love it. Mm -hmm. And boat love is part of that why not factor. Because mm -hmm. that's what's going to make you shine the bright work or clean the bottom or make sure the lines are working well. And, yeah. and that was part of this boat for us. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. I think the why not factor wasn't as big as space speed. Because space speed and sailing is what started the process. But the why not factor is definitely a part of it. Yeah. And actually, I was afraid that people were going to be put off by the boat. And we were going to, excuse me, feel fly. Uh, yeah. Too close to land. Yeah. Feel isolated. You know, that people were going to say, oh, they probably have crew or they probably aren't very friendly or whatever. But really, it's been the opposite. We have a lot of people come and say, wait, is that a gunboat? Or what kind of boat is that? And uh -huh. so we have a lot of people walk up or sail up or ride up or mm -hmm. it swim becomes up. A, it's, all, it's its own conversation. <laughs> it really starter. is. Yeah. yeah. Yep, it's it been fun that is. way. So yeah. it's been a positive. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. It's been very fun. Well, thank you very yeah, much for sharing for it with us. Yes, and it's uh, and thank you for sharing with yeah. everybody, everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it takes a special kind of person to let all of us into their home and into their life and yeah, and yeah. to want to be on camera and everything else. So we really appreciate it, yeah. and I feel like we've learned loads. Yes. I've definitely it's increased my confidence. I definitely don't feel nearly as intimidated mm -hmm. as. I did, I think, Good. just not have been, oh, we haven't been on any performance catamarans, really. I mean, all that, Mare and that's about it. That's kind of the Six extent. Six years ago. Yeah. yeah, and especially just even how your dagger boards are working, it gives us a little bit of FOMO, but we won't talk about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's been good. I feel like I've learned a lot. I feel much more comfortable and more than anything, just super, super, super excited. Good, yay. Yeah. Good, that's guys. what we wanted. Yeah, yeah it's so our thank pleasure. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank all of you. I think that's uh, it that's for us. It, yeah. yeah, I'm sure that was. I uh, yeah. Long and insightful, <laughs> but insightful and enjoyable. Yes. If you're really interested in it, you definitely watch the whole thing. Yeah, it's... If you made it this far, you were really interested. <laughs> that's right, and of course you can. Uh, if you have extra questions about performance sailing, I would say. Don't ask us just yet, but you can absolutely pop over to, <laughs> yeah. to uh, their blog, and I'm sure there is loads more information. You can see a lot more of their journey, especially the Alaska stuff, yeah. because I know there's some blog posts from that. So I'll put a little link on the screen or um, down in the description box, yeah, and you can check that out there. Sounds awesome. Thanks, well, guys. Yep, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> all right cool. cocktail time yeah, yeah, yeah. sure yeah. you guys have been working all day yeah. 1621 it's, <laughs> like it's way almost cocktail we're time. late we're late we're yes. late for cocktail hour thank you guys